Hi, I'm Martin from Green and Bushcraft, and today I'm going to be making a leather strop for sharpening woodworking tools. Now that is definitely the nicest strop I've ever made. We're going to be looking at what strops are, why we use them, what materials we can use to make them, and since it's a leather strop, what kind of leathers can we use to make them? And also, how do we use them as well? So stay tuned for all that good stuff. So I've just finished building my little workshop here and I am so happy with the results that I wanted to make a video to break it in. It's so nice to have a space to actually build things for a change and hopefully it's an easier place for me to share some of those projects with you as well. Now, until now, this has been little more than an outdoor cupboard, so I'm really, really happy how it's looking now. So a little simple project that anybody can do is a leather tool strop for sharpening woodworking tools or any edge tools really. Some of the tools that I might use a leather strop to sharpen are some of the ones that are behind me. Things like chisels, draw knives, axes, plane blades and obviously your normal bushcraft knives as well will benefit from a good stropping every now and again. Now today I'm making a workshop bench type strop, uh, one that I would sharpen tools in the workshop, not necessarily one that I would take out into the woods with me. Generally if I'm going out into the woods on an expedition where I want to be lightweight, I'll just use the back of my belt, putting that around a, a branch of a tree or maybe the thwart of your canoe or something like that, strapping that down and then stropping your knife back and forth on that or your axe is a very serviceable way of making a strop. Obviously you need to be careful you don't cut through your nice full grain leather belt. But today I'm going to be making one that's going to stay in the workshop, it's going to be much bigger and heavier, sturdier and it's going to be for sharpening things on the bench. It's not necessarily something I would take out into the woods with me. I'll cover that in a later video if you want. So firstly, what is a strop? Well a strop is usually the last process you would use in sharpening metal blades. Now it's usually used for much finer edge blades, you know, as the ones I've just mentioned. It's not usually necessary or common to use on things like wood chipper blades, hedge trimmer blades and lawnmower blades. Those are just simply too rough to, to bother going to those sort of lengths for. And strops used in the right way can really put a beautiful edge on any kind of woodworking tools you've got. So not all strops are leather. Uh, the best ones tend to be leather, but uh, sometimes people actually use wood as a stropping medium. Uh, generally things like MDF, you know, things that have a consistent grain or lack of a grain and are a bit softer and porous so that they can absorb things like stropping compounds, which are pastes with very, very fine particles in it that act as a sort of polishing paste almost. That's what really gives your edge blades that mirror shine. People who use these wooden strops are looking for a very, very flat strop that's very hard and there isn't much flex in it so they can get a very, very tight edge. Leather strops are a little bit more forgiving and if you treat them and make them correctly, they can achieve this as well. Strops' primary purpose are to remove burrs, which are tiny, sometimes microscopic little shards of metal that form along the edge of your, your metal tools uh, during the sharpening process. You know, they sort of hang and wobble on the apex of your edge and they need to be removed before you use your tool. Strops are also used to polish your edges and the bevels of your edges as well and this really helps to make sure they're razor sharp. So a typical sharpening scenario for me would be taking a tool that was dull or was a chip or a nick or something like that in it, I would be sharpening it on a coarse diamond stone uh, and until that was nice and flat, you know, diamond stones are always very, very flat and they stay flat. I would then move it on to uh, water stones, progressively going down the grits and getting finer and finer and finer all the time. Once I've got to the finest water stone that I've got or wet stone, I would then start looking at taking it to the strop. And the grit of a leather strop that is impregnated with a polishing compound or with a stropping paste can be measured in tens of thousands of particles per millimetre. So you can really see why I put an absolute microscopic edge on your tools. So let's talk about actually making one of these things. So what we need is a hard, flat base. And I'm going to use wood today. You could use something else. Wood is the more natural choice, isn't it? We all love a bit of wood. And so wood is going to go below. It's going to be a base. And then we're going to have a hard piece of leather on top. And that's going to be our stropping medium. The wood is just a base that we can mount it on. It'll hold it steady. It'll hold it flat. And it can be clamped to a surface in order for us to use it a bit more effectively. So behind me here on the bench, I've got a couple of materials that we might think about using as a base for our strop. Something like this is quite good. This is a piece of birch plywood. It's very flat, 
It's hard, it's stiff, and it's quite easily attainable. You know, you can buy that anywhere. It's quite easy to cut as well. It's already nice and flat, usually squared as well. That could be a good option. I prefer something a bit more heavy duty than this though, because it's a bit light, you can sort of move around. If I use a heavy piece of hardwood, it means that it's gonna be heavy enough that I can use it without clamping it most of the time. So I'm gonna put that to the side for now. Another thing that might be quite good is this dressed pine board. Now again, it's very flat, it's a bit heavier, a bit thicker, looks a bit nicer as well on the plywood. Uh, so that's also something I could potentially use. What wouldn't be good to use is this. Now this is chipboard or OSB. Now this is used for um, you know, building the interiors of houses and sheds and things like that. It's very nice, it's very good stuff, it's very useful. I use it for building shelf bottoms, so it's very, very useful. I also use it for protecting windows when I'm stump grinding or I'm chainsawing near something. It's quite, it's quite good and it's, it's very cheap and readily available. Because what it is is just a load of little wood particles, wood shavings all glued together and, and, and compressed, you know. Now the problem with this is, yes, it's flat, but it's, the surface is not smooth you can see there's little undulations and stuff like that. Now, if you have a really thick piece of leather, that's not really an issue, but if you want to use a thinner piece of leather, some of these little bumps and stuff are going to transfer through into your stropping. I would avoid using things like that. Plus, it's also a bit lightweight and sort of flimsy. Now, what I'm gonna to use today, and I know everybody doesn't have access to this, and this is a piece of oak stave uh, worktop. That I've got, you know, sections of oak that have been cut and laminated together uh, to stop them warping. And this has been through the thickness or planer, which means it's very, very flat, very, very even, and it's heavy, heavy duty, and obviously beautiful. And it smells amazing. This is where whiskey gets a lot of its flavour from, is the oak barrels that it's actually stored in and matured in. So I'm going to cut a piece of this and use it today. This is a piece of an off cut from my breakfast bar that I use. So again, I'm recycling a bit of waste wood. No such thing. So that's a good place to start. You know, another reason why I like this uh, thick oak board as well and, and thicker bases for my strops is that when I'm using things like, let's put this down for a second. I'm using things like my draw knife. To sharpen this, you can see that the handles are kinked. They are, they are lower than the blade, you see? You use it like this. So the blade is actually flat at this point and the uh, handles come down like that. So if I'm gonna be stropping this, I'm gonna strop it like this. So uh, obviously, you know, not cutting towards, but drawing the blade, uh, you know, sort of bevel back across it. So I don't want to hit my fingers on the edge of the table when I'm doing this. So if I've got a thicker board, it means that the strop can be on there and there's not such a risk of me hitting the surface that the strop board is actually sitting on. So uh, that's just another reason why I, I actually quite like these thicker boards for my bench strop. But if you're sharpening small tools, uh, this isn't really an issue because you can take the strop, you can, you can attach it to the side of your bench and then you can use it from off the side of the bench, you know, you can clamp it there. And as long as something's got one handle on one side, that's not an issue. The, the draw knife becomes an issue because it's got a handle on both sides. So normally that isn't an issue, but I like to make these things as practical and as multifunctional as I can when I build them. And of course, you could just take multiple flat layers and just glue them or screw them together and uh, that would achieve the same thing as having a thick board to start with. And I also like to have a hole drilled in it, maybe with a little leather strop hanging off it so that I can hang it uh, out of the way on my tool board ready for use whenever I need it. Now today I'm going to be making it with a lot of power tools because this oak here is already dried, it's already glued and it's very very hard so I'm not going to be able to carve this you know, with an axe or a knife, you know, it would be very very difficult and it would, it would sort of break and flake and things like that and because it's already sort of mostly shaped I can just go ahead and cut this, uh, shape it and sand it uh, and drill it and I'll be pretty much uh, most of the way there to have my base done but there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't use uh, you know, a piece of natural timber and you could uh, shape it with your axe and then smooth it down with a piece of sandpaper on a flat block, flat sanding block, to, to make a lovely uh, hardwood uh, solid base for your, your leather strop. You know, that'd be really, really nice. But today, this is the stuff for me. So I'm gonna make it about 40 centimeters by 15. That's a good size for me. Nicely.
I always keep off cuts like these. You never know when they come in handy. So now that I've reduced my board to the rough dimensions, I'm going to plan out my handle shape. The yoke is very hard, so I did what I could with the miter saw to reduce the work and finish it off with the handsaw. And I got some nice little offcuts. Safety first. I use my angle grinder with a wood carving bit for the rough shape of the handle. I forgot to drill the hole in the handle first, so I stopped carving and used a 20mm drill bit to drill the hole. At this point I really wish I had a pillar drill. I then shape the harder to reach spots with my die grinder with a small, fine wood carving bit. I then use my Dremel with a sanding bit to get into even tighter spots. I finish the handle with sandpaper, moving from 70 grit down to 240 grit. I then flattened the cut edges with my sheet sander with 180 grit paper. After a final sanding of the flat faces, I then took the sheet sander to the edges. I ran the sander along the edges just to break them so that they are more durable and won't hurt as much if you happen to slip and catch your knuckles on them. So if I had a big fancy shop, I probably could have done that a lot simpler, but uh, I've got a lot of hand tools and that's what I'm used to. So there we go, I've finished the base. Well, I mean, that could be a, a nice little chopping board, couldn't it, if I achieved that with uh, some sort of food safe finish. You know, a chopping board or maybe a disciplinary device from the 1800s. Anyway, that's as good. We've, we've done our uh, base and so time to move on to the leather. So when it comes to leathers, this is where it gets a little confusing. I'd like to try and clear some of this confusion up. Now, so there's lots of different kinds of leathers you can use to make a strop. Some of them are much better than others, and some of them are much more inferior to them, uh, verging on the unusable. Now, first of all, it's better to get real leather. There's lots of substitutes out there, like vinyl, uh, which look like leather, and they're very convincing, but they really won't do the job at all. Uh, they're far too plasticky, they don't absorb, they strop and paste, and they're just generally too thin and flimsy, and they fall apart. So avoid them, make sure it's real leather. So within the leather working world, you're going to hear a lot of different words to describe the leather. So you're going to hear things like genuine leather, chrome tanned leather, veg tanned leather, chamois, uh, buckskin. There's loads of different types of leathers out there. Generally, most of them are okay, but I'm going to try and get across to you what to look for when you're trying to choose one for your strop. Primarily what you want is you want a leather that is thick and stiff. Now being thick and stiff it usually means that it's good quality leather anyway because it hasn't been pared down. Most of the leathers that you see, like upholstery leather and, and clothing leather, have been what's called paring down, been sliced very very thin from a single piece of leather. They'll split it down into sort of three or four layers, uh, each layer going down in quality as it gets nearer the, the inside of the animal. And they'll use these different layers for different things. The outside layer with the grain, you're going to see a lot more uh, things like belts and, and sheaths and high quality shoes and high quality bags uh, and as you move down through those layers they're going to start using them for clothing, for upholstery, for making couches and stuff. And the problem with these thinner leathers is that they tend to be much softer and they're usually treated or tanned in a way that makes them even more soft and even more stretchy uh, which is what you don't want. This is a piece of upholstery leather here that I've cut from an old chair and you can see there's a bit of give in it. I mean this is this is not so bad actually, I mean it's, it's, it's real leather, it's been treated on the outside to make it look 
like it's the outside of the animal but it's not it's actually from further down inside the skin and on the back of it, it kind of looks like suede that's what most of these leathers look like when they're first cut and now this is a good side to use we could we could put that down on our uh, a flat base as long as it's very flat and we could use that could that could make a serviceable strop but Whenever something's worth making, it's worth really putting some time into it and making it really good. So if this is all you've got access to, don't fret. You just have to make sure that your base is super flat and whatever you attach it to the base with is also very, very even, you know, so that this stays flat. And that, that, that probably could last you for a little while. That would be all right. So what I've got behind me in, on the bench and this roll is some of the best leather you could consider using for a strop. It's a four millimeter thick veg tanned cowhide. It's full grain leather. It's right from the, the very, very top of the animal. Uh, sometimes you can even see the scars and things on it. But this is very high quality. I use it for making belts, sheaths, anything where you want, something that's gonna be very hard wearing and easy to work as well. You know, I can, because this is veg tanned, I can carve it, I can dye it, I can wet mold it. It's a very, very adaptable and, and useful piece of leather. Now, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as sole leather. Now, that's very often because sole leather is made from veg tanned cowhide. And because it's veg tanned, this is a, an ancient technique that makes for a very hard, stiff leather. You can make this softer if you want, but it starts off hard, it starts off rigid. You can see how hard that is. It's almost like, it's almost like plastic. It's not as flimsy and as, as floppy as this stuff here. It's more like a piece of cloth. This is, uh, you know, real heavy duty stuff. So uh, this is going to be a great place to start for our strop. And you can see why this wouldn't be very good for clothing or for, you know, a, a high quality couch uh, because it's simply just too thick and too tough. You know, that'd be quite uncomfortable to wear, but it's a perfect leather to start, you know, making these high quality, high wear items like axe sheaths and knife sheaths and belts. Uh, so it's very, very strong as well. Now don't worry if you don't want to invest in a full roll of this stuff. This is a quarter of a cow. I've got other leathers in the, the house that are half an entire cow. Those are quite expensive to buy if you're not a, a leather worker. I'm going to make, you know, loads and loads of different things out of this roll and the other the other rolls I've got in the house as well. So if you don't want to do that, you can quite easily buy small pieces off of the internet. You can buy off cuts from leather workers and also there's, there's quite a few leather shops around uh, whichever country you're in to buy leathers like this and you don't have to buy an enormous big piece like this you know usually they're priced by the square foot so you probably could buy something smaller relatively easily I have to say if you can try and go for the higher quality thick stiff veg tanned leathers because these things are going to serve you much longer than the cheaper alternatives you're really you're really going to get the use out of it you know it's going to be stiff your blade is not going to go so far into it it's not going to round off you're going to get a really nice edge and it's going to last you for a long time so I would say that's a good investment to use a, a better quality leather so another thing to consider is what side of the leather do we use for stropping. Now, I would say the higher quality of the leather, the less it matters. Both sides will do just fine if your leather is good and stiff. Now the grain side, which is the outer side, will give you a finer edge than the flesh side, but the stropping compound will stick and be absorbed by the flesh side better than the grain side. Now, if you're going to be stropping large rough blades more often than precision ones, I would actually recommend using the flesh side since it will hold the stropping paste better and it will grab the bigger burrs probably more efficiently as well. But if you're looking for very, very fine precision blade sharpening, then I would go with the grain side. Now, if you get any other questions about what kind of leathers you can use for strops, put it in the comments. I'll try and answer as many as I can. There's a lot to know, so don't feel silly for not knowing things about the leather. There's a lot of confusing information out there that contradicts one another. There's a few different schools of thought about leather from different leather working industries around the world. So don't feel silly if you don't know something. So now that we know a little bit more about the leather we're going to use, let's actually get to working it. Onto the bench. So a couple of things that make your life easier when leather working is a good cutting mat. Now you can find these at craft stores quite often and they're not too expensive and they're a really, really good investment. Another thing is a good knife. Now you can use Stanley knives once we can slide the knife out so that it's supported and so it's, it's not got the full blade out because that's a little bit flimsy and can snap uh, or, or wander within the leather. Leather is very difficult to cut so it's a good idea to have something sturdy. If you've got a leather cutting tool or some leather cutting shears or scissors that's a better alternative to your Stanley knife but it'll do the job in a pinch. Now, since I do a bit of leather working, I have something that's a bit better quality, and this is a head knife. This is a traditional leather working tool that you can see on the sheath. I have got the logo, <laughs> uh, and this is a, a traditional leather working knife, and this really does make that life easier. Again, you don't need to invest in one of these, but uh, I thought since I'm using it, I would let you know a little bit more about it. 
and this can be used uh, in a variety of different ways to cut leather and I think it's a great tool. I can sharpen it, I don't have to throw away any blades, uh, it's going to last me for a long time so I'm really really pleased with that. So I'm just going to double check my dimensions again just to make sure that through all that sanding I have still got the room that I want to use. Yeah that's fine. I'm going to just make sure that it's just ever so slightly smaller uh, than the space I've got so that the edges don't get caught when I'm using it and get peeled up. And also I'm going to leave this little bit here free to be a clamping space. That won't, that won't have any leather on it. Great, so that's 14 by 26, so I am going to cut that out of my piece of leather. You see what I mean about the scars, you can see that there. This edge here I like to keep straight because that's where I cut straps from and leather belts from. I'm going to keep that straight so I'm going to use the other side where as you can see I've already cut uh, a few different patches out for some projects. I think these were some sheaths. I'm going to need two sections because I'm going to do it on both sides of the strop base uh, so I'll try and cut them out using uh, wasting as little leather as possible. So now that I've got my leather cut out, I'm going to work on the durability of it because I want this strop to be as good as I can make it. I want it to last a long time. So, so the same way that I have broken the edges of the oak base, I'm going to put a chamfer or a bevel on the edge of the leather as well. The leather has got quite, you wouldn't call it a sharp edge, but it's a, you know it's a squared edge and that's more likely to get caught in tools and get sort of frayed. So I'm going to use a tool called an edge beveler. And that runs down the edge of these corners and just puts a lovely little chamfer on them. And then I'll probably burnish them as well. And I'll show you how that process works in a minute. So I take the edge beveler and I place it on the edge I want to cut. And it runs along like this. Isn't that pleasing? And that's put a lovely little chamfered edge onto my leather there, hopefully you can see that on the camera. Let's do the rest of these edges. Lovely. So the next thing I talked about was burnishing. Now burnishing is almost like sort of polishing the edge of the leather. And again, this is not something you have to do for every strop, but I'm just trying to make this strop as good as I possibly can make it. And so this will really help maintain the edges of the leather. Leather will do this under use as well, but it's better to do it beforehand so that it is ready to rock right from the word go. I'm just trying to straighten this leather out because it's been wrapped up, you know, coiled. It's taken on a bit of a shape, but it's, it's not difficult to, to, to stretch it back, tease it back straight again before I glue it down. Okay, so burnishing, easiest way to burnish something is to need water. So I've got some water here. I'm going to put it in this little tray here. And a piece of material, tough material. I've got a piece of canvas here, but you can use pieces of uh, denim as well. They're pretty good. There's lots of different things you can use for burnishing. You can use uh, pieces of wood as well. You get specialist bits of wood for doing burnishing. And in fact, I even have one that fits my Dremel that you can uh, attach and it's good for doing big, long, really thick areas of, of edges of leather and you can run that back and forth gently and uh, that does a good job. I find this is one of the best ways for, for burnishing by hand. So I'll just take a bit of water and run that very gently along the edge. The key here is heat and friction. So a bit of water on there to sort of lubricate the fibres a little bit and then rub like that on the edge and you can feel it getting smooth it closes up the fibers and you can get a shine on this if you're going to finish leather sometimes we'll do this before and after finishing you now finishing with leather you might do with a type of wax or, or, or fat to seal it and you would do this before and after and that gives you a really really nice shine on the edge but obviously it's not necessary in this case. So that side is done. I hope I can zoom in for you there. 
See that's the naked edge there, just been chamfered, no burnishing. And that is burnished edge. See how it's a slight shine on it? It's a little bit darker, it's much smoother now, it's much more durable than just the naked edge of leather. So again, this might be overkill, but for me, it's worth doing. You can see how it's much more durable, the edges. Especially in that corner there, it's nice and rounded off. But it looks great because it's uh, nice and neat and tidy. And that's been burnished as well. Nice, eh? And again, this is just naked leather with some water and some friction. So, you can get a lot better with a, a finish, but because we're making it into a strop, we don't want to put a finish on the leather because it'll affect how it absorbs the stropping paste. So both my bits of leather have been chamfered at the edges or beveled and also burnished. They're feeling lovely and smooth now. They've just got a little bit of moisture left in the edges there, so I'm just gonna let them dry out a little bit more. And while they are drying, I'm gonna cover the method of sticking these down to the base. So you can use glue, but what I would recommend you use is some sort of spray on glue, you know, like a contact adhesive that you can spray on. That way you're gonna get a really even level of glue across the top of your base. The problem is with glues that are in you know, squeezy bottles like this is when you put them on, even if you spread them really thinly, it's difficult to get a consistent layer. And because the veg tan leather and other leathers that hopefully you're using for this are, are porous, they will soak up some of that glue. And if it's not even, it can cause hard spots. And again, this can transfer through into your stropping. Now again, this isn't such a big deal if you've got a really nice, big, thick, stiff leather. It's less of a big deal, but it's, it still can happen. So what I tend to use, and what a lot of other woodworkers tend to use, is double-sided tape. Now, not the padded stuff. You want the thin stuff. There's a lot of good brands out there. You go and have a look for them. The wider, the better. Unfortunately, I don't have the wide one here right now. I've only got the thin one. It just means it's going to take a bit longer to, to stretch them out. So I'm going to put that on the board now. And before I do that, I'm just going to mark out where the leather's going to be so that I don't use too much tape. So because I'm going to do both sides of this, I have got some flat boards ready and a few clamps to clamp this down so that these get stuck down straight. It's not going down horrendously tight, but just enough to keep it flat. And this would be very important if I was using glue. It's less important when using the double sided tape, but every little helps. So if you really want to use one of these upholstery leathers, one of these thinner leathers that you've maybe recycled from an old couch or, or maybe it, because it's cheaper, whatever, whatever your reasons, what you want to do is when you're attaching these, make sure you stretch it onto your base so that there's no wrinkles in it. You know, these things stretch quite readily and over time as well, they'll stretch with repeated use and the more products you put into it as well. So you want to make sure when you put it down, you put it down stretched so that it doesn't bunch up on you or have room to move. So while I'm waiting for the tape to set, I'm going to make a little thong, you know, for the end of the strop board, just, you know, for aesthetic purposes and, you know, easier for grabbing, moving around. So I've got this piece of scrap leather that I've obviously been using for sort of texture experimentations and carving and such. So I've drilled a hole in this because I'm going to use a tool called a thonging tool or a lacing tool. Now this creates lace from pieces of leather, you know, very thin strips. You know, I could obviously cut it from the edge here, but I can, if I use this, it'll cut a spiral out of this and I can get a really long piece of lace from this, uh, you know, piece of scrap leather that I wouldn't be using for anything else anyway. There we go, that's more like it. Very tough, maybe I need to replace the blade. And that's the last one I'm gonna get because it's the split now. And there we go. So the, there you go, that's a half decent demonstration. You know, you imagine if you got a decent sized piece of leather, you'd get a lot more there. And obviously if I hadn't made a couple of errors at the start there, I could have got a longer one, but that is oh, almost uh, two feet and a quarter long, so that'll do me just nicely. 
Well, while I've got the time, why not make things more interesting? I wouldn't normally dye this unless I had all the stuff, you know, ready for it. I don't think it's worth getting all my dyeing stuff out for it. But what I could do is I could use these little dye pens. Now, these are just little sort of felt tip pens that you can dip whatever dye you want in on the element that's on the inside. Uh, so I've got a green one and I've got a saddle brown one here. So I might try and jazz this up a little bit with a little bit of colour. Hey, see? Now I'm just putting a bit of leather treatment onto the dyed lace to stop the dye running and to protect the leather. There we go, that has had plenty of time under there. This is definitely overkill for double sided tape. Uh, if you're using glue you definitely want to let it set properly like that uh, when it's kept flat but for uh, double sided tape that is most definitely overkill. But there you go, that's a good result eh? Looking good. Uh, I've got both sides done with my, my leather on a nice solid base. Those are stuck down lovely and flat that looks absolutely great so we're nearly there one thing i'm going to do now is i am going to treat the wood now i didn't treat the wood first because there's some oil in the wood treatment that i use and it would affect the way that the the tape stuck to the wood so i'm going to apply that now and just because i'll basically just because i like to see the grain pop and help keep the wood nourish you know keep, keep it moist uh, but i could i could just use it like this now i am going to leave one inside of the leather naked leather on its own just as a strop without any stropping medium on it or any paste or uh, polishing compound is good enough to to really make, give you a good shine but on the other side i'm actually going to put some stropping paste on it so what i'm going to treat this wood with is a little bit of paste wax now this is paste wax that i've made myself and it is actually food safe i made it from raw linseed oil you know raw linseed oil doesn't have all the nasty additives drying agents and solvents in it it's just on the unadulterated linseed oil and I've mixed that equal parts with beeswax so it makes this sort of hard paste but it should melt under a tiny bit of friction and probably the heat of my fingers would probably do it as well but just again to save myself going in and having to wash my hands I'm going to put on these gloves and I'll just get a little bit of this warmed up and what I might do just to make things slightly you can see it's, it is melting but maybe just to get a bit more off of it I'll put my little heater on it as I'm doing this and that will make it a little bit more pliable. Look at that, it's nice isn't it? No, hopefully it doesn't look that nice with all the little bits on it, but you see the, the difference it goes a little bit darker, really shows the green off. Nice. Helps fill in some of those gaps in the green as well. Admittedly, it's not the most durable of finishes, but it's a finish that I quite like taking with me camping or on expeditions where I might want to make a kuksa or a spoon or a canoe paddle. Just to chuck a bit of this one because it's easy to, easy to transport and it's not going to burst in your camping bag and uh, you know soak everything with uh, horrible you know linseed oil which admittedly when it's on its own it does stink. Get to your destination, your canoe or whatever and then open your bag and realise that it's all leaked all over your, your stuff. Nobody wants that. So this is a nice a nice compromise to that, to an oil. It gives you the benefits of an oil but it also is hard like wax. I'm just getting a little bit of it on the leather there where that doesn't matter too much. You can see how porous the leather is, you know, just the slightest touch with the oil of the you know the, the beeswax goes straight into it. And it's not too different a finish I would actually use for the leather if I was going to make a make something out of the leather and treat it I would probably put a uh, an, an oil or fat based product on it with some beeswax mixed in so it's very very similar to a leather preservative as well as paste wax but there's obviously better alternatives out there but that is looking really good okay I'm gonna clean up my gloves and then I'm gonna get a old sock and I'm just gonna buff that off just wiping off any excess and slightly working it into the wood as well with this See how nice that's starting to look now. Look at that nice sheen. See that sheen? Oh yeah, that's nice. Let's make sure we've got all that wax off there. Now, I'm trying to keep the leather reasonably wax-free right now just because I want to <laughs> make sure you can see it 
before I start putting anything onto it, but the products that I'm gonna put on it, I've got a lot of wax on it, I mean, the stropping compounds and the honing pastes, they usually have a, an element of wax in them to protect your blades and to lubricate the honing and the stropping, so it's gonna look very wet and waxy and dirty after a while anyway. But for now, let's pretend like it's gonna look all nice and shiny forever. There you go, doesn't that look superb? Really nice. I'm happy with that. The last thing I do is to tie on my little strap. So there we go, the strop is finished. For all intents and purposes, that is us done with the build. Our base looks great, our leather's attached really, really well. Everything is finished really, really nicely. I'm really happy with that, and that is gonna serve me for many, many years to come. When the strop and paste and stuff gets too thick, I can actually scrape it off or even sand it off and reapply it. So this, this really will last for years. And obviously you can see it's pretty sturdy. It's gonna last really, really well, I think. Even through sustained abuse, that's gonna last for a long time. Look at that in green, uh, really nice. Okay, so next we move on to how do we use it. So as I said before, one side, probably this side, I'm gonna keep naked because that has actually itself got its own uh, sort of honing capacity, leather, you know, naked leather. So I'll use that to finish everything. And on this side, the one that I got a bit of wax on and things, that is going to be where I'm gonna put my stropping compound. So I'm gonna put that on this now. So stropping compounds and polishing compounds are more or less the same thing where, you know, whatever brand you choose, whatever type you choose, people have got a preference between them. This is the one that most people will be familiar with. It's a sort of green wax with aluminium oxide particles uh, suspended within it. Now you would just take this and you would just rub this onto your stropping. You know, a little goes a long way with this. So just a little, little S shape on it, a little squiggle, and then you, you sharpen away with that hone away with that and reapply it if and when you need it. And this stuff's primarily designed to be put onto like honing wheels, you know those polishing wheels that are on permanent sh bench sharpeners. You just take a little bit of this, the heat of the brush moving, you know the felt disc moving will melt that onto it. But what I'm gonna use today, I was given this stuff, which is Smurf Poo uh, by my friend. And I'm quite keen to give this a little try. It's a, it's a paste rather than a wax. But it, again, it's much the sort of same thing. It's for stropping, it's for honing. Uh, it's made in Britain. And I quite like the idea of it. It's quite funny. Smurf Poo as well, obviously it's blue. So I'm gonna give that a little go today. It does say with the instructions of this stuff that it can slightly stain your hands. So I'm going to wear my gloves again. But it's not that blue, it's a little blue tinge. So I'm not gonna put much of this on. Quite easy to smear that whole thing on, but it's unnecessary. And I can really feel that that is gritty. You know, it's almost, almost imperceivable the grit that's in there because it's so fine. So it's starting to kind of dry up a little bit. That is going to impregnate that leather with a very, very fine particle paste and I should be able to sharpen my blades to a mirror finish on that. Trusting a lot to this new product, the fact that I'm putting on my brand new strop. So as I said before, the two main goals of using a strop are to remove your burrs, which are little microscopic flakes of metal that are on the edge of your blade uh, after you've been sharpening on more aggressive sharpen mediums like diamond stones and wet stones. Now this, the stropping takes that off and also to polish the edge, you know, put a really, really fine razor edge on it. And because it will remove metal from the blade as well as removing the burr, you know, the leather will catch the burr and it'll pull it off. So one of the really good examples of something that I would, wouldn't necessarily actually have to take a burr off of is my head knife. Now head knife is like a razor, it's really scary sharp. It has to be to go through leather. You know, you see it earlier how tough it was to get through that leather. Leather is very resistant to cutting, one of the reasons why it's been such a popular material over the years. But what I need to do every now and again with the head knife is take it to the strop. Uh, I very, very rarely ever need to take this to a sharpening stone. Uh, just because I'm not using it in that rough an environment, I tend not to use it uh, over a concrete floor where I could drop it and I could, I could nick it. Uh, there's no metal or anything in the things I'm cutting. It's all nice, clean leather. So it tends to get dull, but it never tends to get blunt, if you know what I mean. So just taking this to the strop every now and again is plenty good to keep this edge like an absolute razor. So I'm going to 
sharpen this, for want of a better word, you know, return the edge to its real, you know, razor sharpness on the, the strop. And then what I'll do is I'll probably sharpen something that's blunt, i.e. like a chisel uh, or like a draw knife. And I will, like it's been used in a much rougher environment. I will sharpen that with my diamond stones and my whetstone, and then I'll take it to the straw. I'll remove the burr and I'll put that really polished edge on it and you'll see but I mean this thing is really really effective. Ah, sorry about that I actually didn't press record there <laughs> so what I'm doing uh, I'm taking my head knife I'm going to strop this on the head knife I was going to show you the black being created because you know uh, metal is being removed but I've just went ahead and did it so sorry I didn't realize it wasn't uh, recording so I'll just do that again but you, just, you won't be have the benefit of seeing it happen in the fresh I'll, I'll turn it this way so you can see maybe see it on the other side So you see these black lines I'm creating? That is metal being removed. And that is putting an absolute scary edge on that. Oof. Very nice. I really hope you can see this in the camera, but that has put a beautiful polish on the very edge of that blade. I really hope I can I can focus on that. I may have to manual focus it. You can see that it has put a mirror finish. There you go, there's a little mirror finish there. Really nice. Still got a little bit of stopping compound on it. I can take that off and I'll maybe just finish that on the leather side itself. One of the nice things about having leather on both sides of the strop is that the strop grips the workbench surface so it doesn't slide around when you're using it. <laughs> that is frightening. That is absolutely frighteningly sharp. Excellent. That's really what I wanted. There we go. Look at that. That is really nice. So you can see how that worked. That worked really, really nicely. And I'm going to have to be very, very careful when I'm using that, <laughs> that I don't A, cut myself, or B, cut too far into the leather that I was using, because it is, oh, that is scary sharp, almost like the day it was made. Fantastic. Good. Well, I'm going to put that back in a sheath, and I'm going to turn my attention now to something that's in a bit more a desperate state. Look at that. I used a wood chisel to pry apart two pieces of metal. In my desperation and not having a cold chisel at hand, I used this to get two pieces of metal apart. And that is why it's like that. Absolute sacrilege. But anyway, it needs sharpened back. So I'm going to start on the 400 diamond stone and then work my way up. It's in a terrible state, this. There you go, made some progress. I have flattened out that horrible nick, and so I'm going to move on to the water stones. It's looking better and better after the 6000 grit. You can see you've got a nice shine on there. It's not perfect, but this is a, a, a more of a sort of rough chisel anyway, so I don't want it absolutely crazy straight, otherwise, I would have a, a, a guide. But that's looking good, a lot straighter, much, much sharper. And so I'm going to take it to the strop now. So that's maybe had 10 strokes. And look at that edge, almost mirror finish. I mean, you could possibly even read something in that reflection. Incredible. There's my chainsaw bar up there. Really good, eh? This is why these things are so effective. And I'm just holding it at the correct angle, or as close to it as I can manually, drawing it back away from the blade. I don't want to cut towards this on the strop. 
and what a beautiful edge it puts on it. I'll just slightly flatten off the back as well. I won't get such a fine polish on the back, but because I haven't been doing so much with the back on the uh, on the sharpening stones, but if I kept going, you could see that that would create a shine as well. But as long as it's flat, that's fine. And that is, <laughs> I mean, infinitely better than what it was. And that's not taking long at all, really. I've only been at this for maybe I don't know five minutes. Look at that. Let me get it even closer for you. Absolutely mirror finish. And this and the strop will do that to most of your tools. Turn it over on the naked side, give it a last strop and paste, smurf boo seems to work well. And my strop is excellent. I haven't even had to clamp it down yet. It's just been heavy enough, sturdy enough that I can sharpen as is. Very nice. I was so pleased at how the Since sharpening was going, I decided to do the rest of my tools. Here you can see how easy it is to sharpen my big draw knife on something so thick. My bushcraft knife is pretty sharp already, but I thought I could use a little touch up. And boy, did it work well. After that, I turned my attention to more chisels. So here's what I meant by a bar. I wonder if you can see that there. So you see that on the edge there? A little... This is quite a big one. Sometimes they're so small you can't see. That one is very obvious. I can even deform it with my hand. It's very difficult for me to show you this on the camera. But... You see that little... So that's what we're going to be taking off with a strop, even down to the tiniest little amount. See it deform there? There you go. That's a bar. It's a very big bar. So I finished the chisels and decided to give them a little test. Now this is seasoned ash end grain and it is super hard and look how nice these cut through. And it's just an absolute pleasure to use now. Look at how sharp it is. That's what I'm talking about. So I gave the rest of the chisels on my tool board the same treatment. And that is a much more respectable chisel set now. So there we go, that's us done. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about making leather strops there. Or you've, you know, we discussed what kind of layers we can use, what kind of bases we can use, and we've talked about strop and paste, why we use them, how we use them. So hopefully you've got a better idea of how to use your leather strop now, whether you need one or not, and hopefully this will give you a bit of information if you want to make your own. And be sure to join me in my next strop making video, where we're making a strop from the birch polypore, otherwise known as the razor strop fungus. Thanks very much for that, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Please like and subscribe as I'll be releasing videos regularly and you won't want to miss them. And also like our Facebook page where you can see information on upcoming videos and other interesting bushcraft and foraging posts. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.